today let me take you through the journey of uh, mrs kanmani she is a resident of chennai and a flower vendor by profession and her life entirely depends on um, public transportation and her place of work is a public space so she walks on foot every day to take a bus and this is the pavement which she takes it's broken dirty unwelcoming in fact a study says that almost 37% of all female trips are by walking while that of male is just 26% this is a bus stop as you can see it's it's crowded it's sultry with bereft of any civic amenities no seating no shade she just has to wait for the bus in this crowded area a study shows that women travel as long as on an average 5.8 kilometers for work and bus is the most preferred mode of transportation this is popularly called the pink bus the free of cost travel for women and the good news is that 79% of women confided that they are no more dependent on anybody anyone else to take a travel this is a familiar sight for many of us it's a crowded marketplace kanmani spends a good amount of her day here sitting and doing her vending but how many of us have ever wondered how do women here relieve themselves access to safe and clean public toilets is still a distant dream for all of us this is a way back home a dark alley without any street lights naturally men and women tend to avoid dark secluded spots but for very different reasons for women it's mostly primarily safety i remember even when i was a student i used to take the public transportation and all that i remember is to i used to blast loud music in my earphones just to drown the noise of the city and to avoid the prying eyes of onlookers i would just put my head down and walk straight i remember even if i was little late my mother used to keep calling me to check on me if i'm safe and then i always wanted to get back home without any distasteful event on my way back this is not an isolated event in fact all the women in india or across the world have faced these kind of situations it dawned upon me that women actually do not come on roads for leisure they do only with a purpose in fact they have to justify why they are on a public space this robs women of any kind of good opportunities or benefits which the city can bestow on them families and women are scared to travel a distance even if it means a gainful employment or a pursuit of education women just don't want to do it cities as you know are growth engines which attract talents across the world across genders in fact with 48.5% of the population being women and almost 27% in total workforce all of our cities are traditionally designed by men from an able bodied male perspective where is the inclusion so here we see two different cities suffering from an urban planning problem the first one seems to be suffering from a terrific traffic problem while the other has totally forgotten about its cyclists and pedestrians these are nonetheless philippines and pakistan now here are two cities which have citizens mobility access and safety in mind cities that focus on these aspects as the prime responsibility these are chennai and pune so diving deep so diving deep it comes to the fore that inclusive urban planning is not an indian problem but it's a global issue now vienna is one such city which has boasted of gender mainstreaming and why can't we be vienna why can't we look at cities through a gender lens in fact it was surprising to know that vienna was the first one 
in the early 90s to put up a women-centric office to look at all these civic amenities and infrastructure from a female perspective. Have you ever thought of that before? So coming back to the story of Chennai and why I'm here, with the youngest women mayor heading the city right now, and almost 50% of political representatives being women, there was a huge boost which was given for this gender mainstreaming program. Sensing the right opportunity, the government of Tamil Nadu, partnering with the World Bank, brought in a body, a body which will look into all aspects of gender inclusion and solve all the existing gaps in planning, policy, and implementation. It was important to institutionalize this body. The Gender and Policy Lab was thus formed, a platform which allows public and the government officials to interact, understand, and discuss issues of civic amenities, infrastructure, and transportation from a gender perspective. In fact, city's primary responsibility is to take care of the most vulnerable in the sector vulnerable sections of the society and vulnerable sections span across a large gamut. Women, children, third gender, women, uh, people with different, different needs, people coming from diverse backgrounds, livelihood, cutting across all intersectionality. And children being the most vulnerable, they are an essential partner of change, an important stakeholder in building a better city. In an upcoming infrastructure project, we thought, why not involve children and understand what kind of neighborhoods they want? So we did. We called them, we discussed them. They mapped the neighborhoods that made them happy. They mapped the streets, which were a little unsafe, and we needed to work on it. In fact, I remember a fiesty little girl coming up and saying, Akka, I want to just run in the beach, unperturbed, freely, without any disturbance, without any fear. Don't our children deserve a safe environment? We did a citywide perception study just to understand how do women perceive our city and their services. I would like to just cite some anecdotes out of it. Women said that they don't wait in a bus stand for a very long time. In fact, they take a bus, go to another stand and wait because the longer they stay, the longer they get looked at, mistaken for it. Sad but true. Women said if they are inside the bus and they are vocal about a harassment, then both men and women taunt them and say, don't complain because it's free of cost for you. In fact, we had a safety audit done to understand how safe is our city. And then the kind of services looked at from different gender was different. Women said they feel safe when they see a police officer in a night waiting in the patrol. But a trans woman revealed that she is still hesitant to approach a police officer. In fact, if I remember her name, her name was Miss Rose. She said that every day is an existential crisis for her because she doesn't know which toilets to take. Whether should I get into a pink bus or a green bus? She said, I don't want the auto drivers to slow down when they see me because there is a disgust in their eyes. I feel I don't belong to the city. So this is a common sight for many of us, depiction of our daily neighborhood. We see women, uh, men enjoying their time, having a good time with their friends, chit-chatting, having their drink, having their tea, snacks at the tea shop, gymming in the park, all of this. But have any of us ever seen a bunch of women doing the same? Absolutely none. Why? Don't. Women deserve the same kind of rightful public space as their male counterparts. Don't we have the right to leisure? A city's day looks different from its night. So we wanted to experience it. So we did a night walk. A group of volunteer women from cutting across different age and background, they come, came with the officials, we went around exploring the history of, uh, history of Madras. And then even people in power asked us, why did women aimlessly roam around at nights and that to talking history? The very question is the answer why these kind of initiatives need to be institutionalized. They need to be propagated because cities are for all at all times of the day. All of this thinking comes from a very deep-rooted social, cultural, behavioral underpinnings and we wanted to change it for good 
at least for the next future generation. And we did. We tried putting up gender clubs, a safe space within schools where children can come and discuss gender-related issues. Adolescent boys and girls can discuss gender-related issues, life skill, and gender-based violence. They should be aware of it. Even small behavioral changes, like a boy washing up Tiffin after he has his lunch, and a girl helping around lifting benches, goes a long way in breaking stereotypes. We even brought in mixed gender teams, football and cricket, breaking stereotypes through sports. Gender and Policy Lab, in its inception, has brought in a lot of change. In fact, the impact has been felt across. Impact, though small, has been incremental. This is the impact. This is one of the impact. Streetlights are in a very wide roads are usually placed at the center, and the pedestrians are always at the sides. So usually the light doesn't reach. So we wanted to change the design, and we did. We asked our women, what brings you to parks? They said, our children, because they need a pretense to come outside. We said, OK, let's make kids designated area in all our parks, and we did. We brought in unisex equipment for exercising for all genders. We looked at bus shelter designs, and some of the women reported that there was a small gap at the back, and men, men tend to urinate in the nights. So we closed the gap. We brought in an independent lighting system for the bus stands, so that even without an advertisement, the women can go there and be safe. All these small initiatives made a huge difference to their lives. All of this gets compounded with the government intervention. In fact, the Metropolitan Transport Corporation brought in the panic buttons. The button can be pressed by any woman who feels harassed or threatened inside a bus. A call to action, just a click away. Then the Greater Chennai Police had put up pink patrols, women-led police patrols at nights. All these small things have instilled great confidence in public. Now, with all these interventions, let's get back to the story of Kanmani. Kanmani is still a fruit vendor. She still takes the public transportation. Her, pay, her place is still a public space. But what has changed? The payment which she takes is clean, wide, not broken. Instead, it welcomes her. The bus stand she goes to has a shade, a good seating arrangement, and even a place to keep a bag. She chit-chats around her friend and gets into a bus happily without any discomfort or even fear. She reaches a place which is a well-kept vending area. The public restroom, which was once a source of anxiety for her, is now a space which is clean, reliable, and operational round the clock. She feels happy about it. She hums a tune and comes back in a well-lit street area. Kanmani's life, which was distraught and uncomfortable, is now a tale shaped with progress, care, and hope with all the city's collective efforts. Cities as growth engines and women playing the most important developmental role need a rightful place in our society. And this cannot be done sustainably and scalably without the involvement and coming together of our elected representatives, administrators, researchers, designers, urban specialists, mobility experts, and last but not the least, our own citizens. Let us make our cities innovation hubs which look at gender mainstreaming as the major aspect. Gender should not be an afterthought. Rather, should be an approach of collaborative governance. Women should no more be mere spectator to this process, but rather be active partners in change and development. Thank you.